Okay. Yep. Alright guys, can you hear? Uh, okay, good. Just for the information, right. I, will, I will I will on the uh, live on the Facebook also. Okay, on now. Yeah. Uh, yep. So guys, screen. can you hear me? Uh, Cyrus, right? Yeah. Uh, okay, okay, good now. Okay, yeah. So I can live my uh, uh, live my video. It's all already live. Yep, I updated the settings uh, for the video. Um, are you able to see it now? Okay, I think uh, can I share my screen and let everybody in? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. uh, people cannot see me, is it? Can't you, see. You, you try to on your video and see. Mm. Unable to start video, you can't start video because the host has stopped it. Yeah, because I already changed the setting. Uh, mm. Still not able. Which allows... I think we just do screen share. Uh, Chong Yi, can you, uh, yep. can you let me have the uh, video on? All the body video on in the panelists, everybody. Yes, I already, I already changed the, I already changed it, the settings on my uh, control, mm -hmm. so uh, everybody should uh, able to get the video up. No, not yet. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, can't. I'm uh, not sure whether maybe. Uh, because we already started, so it uh, doesn't affect. But uh, I think it doesn't matter, we just go ahead. Mm -hmm. We just go ahead, let everybody in. Yep. Everyone's in. Uh, I believe they're all already in. Yeah. Mm, you're not already, not attendee there. Welcome to the... So, mm -hmm. Hello, is everybody there already? So thank you everyone for uh, joining uh, Asia Business Talk Show. Yeah, today um, it's good that to have all of you. So I would like to introduce um, why uh, we started Asia Business Talk Show. It's because we believe in the value creation globally. And in order to have a great value creation, we need to reduce confrontation and also uh, increase collaboration uh, among, among the, all of us. And for commercial value creation, there are important four key elements that uh, can contribute to strong uh, commercial value creation. Uh, these are, they are business owners, investors, regulators, and also talents. And all of these uh, four elements, they must uh, work together closely. That means the business owners, the investors, regulators, and talents must work together uh, closely. And that's why in our slogan or positioning, we always consciously position ourselves as the preferred platforms for business owners uh, investors, regulators, talents, and to drive a constructive communication to create value for each other. So today we are honored to have a panelist, um, a team of panelists to join us to drive this conversation. So we have uh, Steve Bunce, he's a senior managing partner of ACMS Security and Risk Consulting. And we also have Nikki, a senior managing partner of ACMS Business Application. We also have Kizun, a senior managing partner of ACMF Human Capital, and Ginhai, a senior managing partner of ACMF Human Capital. Edward, senior, man senior managing partner of ACMF Corporate Services, and Cyrus Chim, senior managing partner of ACMF Digital. So allow also allow me to introduce today's host. So. I have, uh, we have a uh, Chong Yi, Senior Managing Partner of ACMS Strategy Alliance. And the one that looked like me and sound like me, Louise, Head of Global Strategy of ACMS Strategy and Grow. 
And all the details of the speakers today's panelists and also hosts, you can go to our Facebook, ACMF group Facebook. The details are there. And allow me to, without further ado, to introduce our first speaker, uh, Jeremy. Jeremy Chia is the Senior Managing Partner of ACMF Corporate Services. So he has his Bachelor Degree in Applied Accounting, Oxford Brookes University, U United Kingdom. And himself is currently also a ACCA, a Malaysian Institute of Accountants, and also ASEAN Chartered Professional Accountant and registered financial planner. So his company is offering accounting services, business valuation, company secretary, and tax. So I would like to hand over the screen to Jeremy. So allow me to stop sharing, then I will allow Jeremy to share his screen. So I've uh, stopped sharing my screen. So uh, Jeremy, feel free to take over. Yep, we see your screen. And uh, I have not heard your audio, so you may want to check your audio. Yeah, I uh, can see. Uh, yeah, can hear you now. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, can, can see your slides <laughs> well now. Okay, clear. Yep, it's clear. Okay, sure. Uh, okay, good afternoon, everyone. So uh, my name is Jeremy. I'm basically the senior managing partner of our ECMF Corporate Services. So the topic that I would like to share with you all today is basically regarding diversity to opportunity. How SME going to manage the cash flow and survive throughout the lockdown? So before actually we go in, in details to discuss about the cash flow and the difficulties that are going to be experienced by the SME, I believe that uh, we should look into the overall context and understand what actually is going on, right? So basically, currently we experience an epidemic uh, called COVID-19, which affect more than 200 countries worldwide. And uh, I just want, would like to share with you guys, uh, you know, uh, to make a very close comparison, okay, uh, between SARS and COVID-19. So what you can see here is, uh, this is basically the details for SARS. So as you remember, SARS is actually happening in 2000, back in 2003 and actually is spread across from uh, 1st of November 2002 to 31st July 2003. So the number of cases is uh, more than 8,000 and with a casualty of close to 800. And for COVID-19, as of uh, 31st March, we have 786,000 of reported cases with uh, the, close to 38,000 of dead cases. And of course today, it just past the mark of 1 million, right? So, the next questions that I think of SME uh, need to ask ourselves is like, uh, how serious it can be in terms of uh, economic impact, right? I think we must bear this in mind from a macroeconomic point of view before we can zoom in in details uh, to our businesses. Okay. Hi, brother Jeremy. Sorry to disturb. Uh, would you yep. mind to share your screen to presentation man? Thank you. Uh, to who? Presentation mode. Yep. Oh, okay. Thank you. You hang on. Uh. Let me check on yeah. this. Maybe we are uh, slightly larger so that audience can see the details. Yeah. Thanks, Jeremy, sure. brother. Sure, sure. Okay. Can you guys see now? Is it bigger? Yeah, yep. okay. much better. Uh, okay. Much better. <laughs> Maybe you can uh, use, you can reshare the screen, but choose the slideshow because this is the presenter mode. Okay, sure. Uh, choose a screen that has the full slide one. Yeah, you hang on. Sorry for that. Okay. This one? Look okay? Yes, yeah, that's great. Uh, okay, much better, right? Okay, thanks, uh, buddy. How? Uh, uh, okay. Sure. Uh, now you can see the figures, right? Okay. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So I think uh, before we can answer like how serious it can be in terms of economic impact, I think first of all, uh, I mean the most straightforward will be looking at the government measurements. Okay. 
So I would just use uh, Singapore as an example. So as far as you're concerned, Singapore government actually have uh, rolled up a 55 billion Sing dollar worth of uh, stimulus package, which is the highest in the history of Singapore. And out of this, actually, this is also the second time that actually they draw funds from the National Reserve uh, since 2009, right? So this is the measurements that roll out by Singapore government. And the next one is actually Malaysia. Okay, we in total we have rolled out 250 billion of stimulus package, also the highest in Malaysia history. Okay, so some people uh, actually perhaps may ask, is it that serious? Then I think uh, I would say let's look back to history so what we can see what it could be the trend look like and the worst case scenario. Okay, so I want you to look at the next graph actually. Uh, showing the economic growth of uh, China during the SARS, okay? So you can see that SARS actually started in November and China subsequently informed the WHO on February 2013. And the total numbers are uh, hit 8,000 uh, by May. And this is how you can see the trends of the economic growth of China. Actually, it pumped from 11% to 9%, okay? So, and it slowly climbed back. The next data that you can look at is basically the impact on China trade. Also, it showed a similar pattern, okay? It hit the lowest point on May, whereby they have the highest cases. So, the next question is, it had take how long for China actually to recover? So, from the, this graph, you can actually see it took almost six months, more or less, for Singapore government as well. So, this is also the latest uh, estimations from Asian Development Bank. What could be the worst case, moderate case, and base case of this COVID-19 towards the economy of Asia country? So, what you can see, the, it is likely to impact about $22 billion in terms of GDP growth of all the Asia countries except for China. Okay, so... By understanding the macro uh, economic context, I think now we can actually go into the more in details. So uh, what and how it will impact the cash flow of SME bosses. So before we talk about cash flow, I think we need to understand what is cash flow in the first place. Cash flow basically means cash. If you want me to give you an example, it's basically it's like a fuel for a car. If a car runs over petrol, it will just stop working until it's being refilled. Cash keeps the business running. And in order for you as an SME bosses to know whether you can survive throughout this COVID-19 outbreak, it is important that you must perform something called cash flow forecast. So in very layman terms, I would just uh, name this so-called cash flow forecast as a petrol on your car. So basically, you can tell you exactly how far your business can travel before it needs to fill up again, right? Just like before you go out for a trip, a long distance trip, I think the first thing that you're going to do is to check your car, how much fuel you have. Same thing in a business, you have to perform this cash flow forecast at least for 12 months in these situations. Okay, so in case some of you don't know how the fuel meter look like, you know, Okay, so in simple cash flow element basically consists of three categories. Okay, so first one is the operating activities. So what is operating ex uh, activities actually? So it basically means the money you receive or the money that you pay related to your business. For example, if today you are a company who run a, a trading business, when you pay your suppliers or your purchase material, this uh, consider cash outflow, okay? And when you collect money from the sales, we call it as a cash inflow. And because both the payment and receiving cash is related to your nature of your business, we call it as a, a cash inflow or outflow relating to the operating activities. And then the next elements of cash flow is called investing activities. So what is investing activities? It's basically involved for the purchase of your fixed asset, okay, or disposal of your fixed assets, okay. So, for example, your plants, your machinery, 
your factory, so on and so forth. And the last elements of cash flow is basically the financing activities. Financing activities uh, basically is quite simple. If today your company more fund, you can basically raise the fund either from the shareholders or you can get the bank borrowings, right? So if you manage to get the bank borrowings or raise some funds from your shareholders, basically we call it as a cash inflow from financing activities. But at the same time, if today you still need to serve your loan, for example, higher purchase, your bank borrowing, okay? So, and you need to pay out the money to serve all this loan, then we call it as a cash outflow from financing activities. Uh, uh, Jeremy, uh, Louis here. Yep. Uh, just a question uh, about these cash flow elements or this cash flow projection. Is it something that uh, SME normally they will do it? Uh, yeah, but before they can actually do this, uh, they need to understand, for example, the operating activities, which mean uh, the cash position from the ac operating activities of the business. You know, yeah. yeah. Because I see quite many of my client uh, SME, when come to cash flow projection, they don't have the habit. Um, of course, during the good time, it doesn't have too much of uh, impact because basically business as usual. They right. always know there's enough money to pay all the bills. But time like this, uh, I, I foresee it's going to be harder, especially you suddenly have a movement control for a period of time. Then the uh, income of the business become uh, interrupted. So, so how this uh, cash flow element uh, is being affected as well? It is a, it will they be like suddenly they need to adjust or something? Because it is now the whole things that you have a COVID nineteen you have a movement control. So, so, so how this uh, cash flow uh, mm. exercise uh, helpful to the business owner or to the at least to the SME? Sure. Completely understand uh, your, your question, uh, Brother Luis. So no worry, I will share uh, with you guys more about the action plan. So this slide is basically uh, more to let you guys understand like uh, sure. what is the elements of the cash flow. So uh, after, after you understand the terms for this, then I will teach you like how actually you can look into your business by using these three main elements. Is understand. that answering your yes. yes, yeah, okay. thank you. Sure, no worry. Okay. So basically, uh, I think for all SME bosses, you just need to keep this thing in mind. You know, I understand that when it comes to cash flow projections, a lot of questions pop into your mind. It's like, okay, so fixed costs, variable costs, you know, payroll, salary, rentals, right? But before we look into those details, first of all, you have to understand uh, what are the three main elements, okay? Before you can zoom into the details, okay? Okay, next slide. So before we, we talk about the action plan, I think the, we, we just need to do some quick stress test okay uh for 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 your own company okay so in order to do this stress test basically you just need to ask yourself uh, two simple questions so is your fixed expenses kept at 10 to 15 percent of your revenue okay of course this depends on your industry but in overall this is the average if let's say your fixed expenses is just consists of 10 to 15 percent of your revenue i would say you are basically in a safe zone okay if you exceed more than that you have to re into it. So later, I will tell you how actually you can use the three elements to revisit your cash flow positions, right? So the next question that uh, I think all SME bosses have to ask themselves is like, basically, do you have enough cash reserve that can last for at least six months, right? So how you can actually you complete the six months? Actually, it's very simple. You just need to work out what's your fixed expenses. For instance, your payroll and your rental, right? So this is your monthly fixed cost. You multiply by six months. This is basically the reserve that you must have on hand in order for you to survive for this uh, period of time. So just answer these two questions, okay? And then you have a better understanding whether where is your position for today. Okay. So the next things that we need to look into is like what you need to do now, okay? What is action plan? So since the MCO is uh, for one month period of time and two weeks pass, right? So even though you cannot start your shops or factory, but there's something that you still can do, okay? Which is the planning part. Okay, so this is uh, to address uh, your question, Brother Louis. This is how I think uh, I bring it apart again. 
the three elements of the uh, cash flow. So basically what you need to do, re look into is basically your company financial health by using the three main elements. So now I will just talk about the operating activities. So basically operating activities means the sales and purchase and the payment of expenses of your business, right? So then the first question that you can ask yourself is like, did your sales actually get affected, right? If the answer is yes, then how many percent? Okay, so in order for you to do a, a proper cash flow forecast or planning, actually you have to quantify the impact. Okay, so uh -huh. first, yeah. Okay, yeah, go ahead, thanks, thank you. Sorry. Okay, sure, sure, I thought you have questions. <laughs> okay, okay. so yeah, so this is because uh, if let's say your sales are affected, definitely you have to quantify how many percent. And the, next, the last question you need to ask is, uh, how it actually uh, impact your collections. Are you foresee that your customer going to pay you uh, even uh, later, okay? So then the question you have to ask yourself is, uh, on average, what is your debtor collections periods? 30 days, 60 stay, or 90 days? If let's say you are now already 90 days, are you foresee it to be longer, right? Because at the end of the day, a healthy company should have a net cash inflow from their operating activities. So in short, what you collected, and after you pay out all your payables, your suppliers, you must have a net cash inflow positions. That is considered healthy. But what you collected after you pay out all your supplier and you are in a net cash outflow positions, then uh, it will be very difficult for your business. Okay. So if let's say now your business is already in a net cash outflow position from your operating activities, which means whatever you have collected is not sufficient to pay the supplier, then not to worry, then I will ask you the next questions. Investing activities. So for those business owners actually have a plan to actually to, to buy a new factory or buy a new shop load or buy a new machines, then I would like you to ask yourself a question. Can you on hold all this plan or not, right? That's why I put a question, can you cut down the capex spending. Capex basically means the capital expenditure as in layman's and buying assets, right? So if the answer is yes, perhaps you can have some reserve over here, okay? So you can use so-called the cash that you reserve by delaying the capex spending to pay for your uh, operating activities, okay? If let's say the answer is no, and you have no plan to, to, to spend anything to buy assets, and yet, okay, you are experiencing a cash outflow from operating activities. Then my next question to you is, do you have any non-core asset that actually can be disposed of and to raise funds? For example, do you have any uh, land or shop, okay, that you, can, you actually can now cash out, you know? Uh, but bear in mind, you might need to sell it at a lower price, okay? That's why this is a moment for other people uh, to buy an undervalued asset as well, you know. But in terms of survivability of the business, these are the questions that you have to ask yourself. If the answer is yes, you can dispose, okay, even with discounted price. But if it can last you for another six months to one year, you know, uh, I think this should be part of the plan. Uh, Jeremy, uh, I have a question here because uh, what I'm looking at is uh, one of the best practice, mm. but today, the financial crisis is quite different from what we have gone through during 1998 and also, also 2008. Yep. The time basically is a pure financial crisis and the consumer behavior are basically still the same. Uh, you still can expect them to purchase a byproduct the same way. Yep. But this COVID-19 uh, actually introduced uh, new things. It's like they, it, it, after COVID-19, uh, this um, Chinese New Year, you suddenly you see a lockdown, movement control, and things like social distancing, and online buying behavior. Like even today, like this uh, Zoom or this uh, e-meeting or webinar, it become more norm now, and a lot of people start to buying a product online, and then could be consumed the product offline online. So this is uh, uh, and also something called uh, working from home, remote working. And together, the challenges of a global recession. So this, this combination is quite funny. 
it is quite quite weird because normally when you talk about global recession your market size shrink your gdp shrink but this round the effective market size of a company actually increase significant significantly uh, what i mean is this because you now you do last time you do business in uh, singapore you only deal with people from singapore or kuala lumpur from kuala lumpur but because now everybody move into online a bit suddenly you based out of singapore or kuala lumpur you start to can do business regionally so that's why we, we observe that there are a lot of uh, overseas uh, international players started to go into the marketplace they don't usually go into so with this effective market size uh, increase, I'm not too sure how this uh, financial um, or cash flow projection should be changed to accommodate that part. I, I think today, this challenge is quite new to a lot of people, to business owners, even to consultant advisors like, uh, like us as well. So I don't have a solution yet, mm. but then I think this is a platform we want to talk about it. So yes. I'm not too sure this uh, cash flow side, how, how you want to address that part. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Sure. Sure, uh, uh, completely understand your, 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 your question of dollar risk. Yes, I do agree with you. Uh, due to you know, the advancement of technology, you know, basically it changed the way we does business. Okay, so as compared to 2003, I think we are more, much more advanced uh, as compared you know, and much more well prepared at some point. So how this cash flow projection actually can help the SME, basically it helps to trigger, trigger the questions okay, uh, in the SME versus mind. I'll give you an example, operating activities, right? Okay, so if let's say I'm now the owner of a, of a so-called supermarket, for instance, right? So let's say, uh, and basically your business, basically you just open a door and then people just come in and buy foods, right? And because of the MCO, more or less, it could affect your business, right? Because of the locations or geographical, you know? And this is where, and for example, now you do not have any uh, online store Okay, because as we you can see now, actually there are quite numbers of uh, so-called uh, supermarket. They're actually not only having an online or offline store, but actually they're also having an online store. So when you ask yourself a questions, uh, did my sales get affected or not, right? So and let's say for example, yeah, the answer is yes, and it's fifty percent. So I think the next question you need to ask yourself is like, should I change my business model or not? Okay, and how should I change it? So I think, for instance, digital marketing could be one of the way that actually uh, uh, the, the business owner need to ask, okay? So since a lot of people now doing so well by doing online sales, so why don't you change your business model, okay? By set up your own online store. By doing so, actually your sales is not get affected, but actually you can create another channel actually to make your sales even more or higher, right? So by doing this cash flow forecast, after you, you understand that this, are, this is your situation now. This is only what you have if you don't change. By doing this, then you, you will ask yourself another question, next set of questions like, what should I do now in order to turn around these situations? Okay, and how, right? So this uh, basically will, will, will allow you to basically uh, think from a broader context. So did I answer your question? Very yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I actually I like your answer. Uh, mm -hmm. Just to add um, some um, observation to current situation. Sure. Normally, when global recession, the time uh, when the GDP or the market size uh, shrink, is actually not much you can do. Sometimes you just need to uh, control your cost. But this coupling with uh, effective uh, market size increase, so actually this is the time that you increase or to grow your business instead of become defensive mode. Mm, and, exactly. and, and this... Th in this combination of lack, lack of cash flow or suddenly your existing customer reduced in purchasing, but then the potential uh, sales increase is so high in the near future. So it's like with the existing cash, limited cash flow, how to look into business growth. Normally, the, the solution uh, people use is a fundraising. Of course, yep. fundraising, they can have a lot of options. They have a public fundraising and they have a private fundraising and they even have a fundraising from institution or fundraising from 3F, the family, or the friends and also the fans. So, but, but the fundamental of a success of fundraising, I, I observe is that 
the cash flow projection must be there at least, and then, and then it must be as accurate as possible. And I'm not too sure, because I also understand you guys supporting some fundraising exercise as well. So is this something you mandatory must have for all the fundraising company to have some cash flow projection or preparation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Basically, uh, Brother Luis, you are right. So basically, in order for, I mean, if I think we, we can split into two parts, like, you know. First, if, mm -hmm. since I also show here the financial activities, of course, uh, let's say you can't get, you are having a cash outflow, you know, net cash outflow from operating activities, you cannot dispose any non-core asset to raise fund from the investing activities. I think the only option that you left is financing activities, right? So when we talk about financing activities, basically, like what you say, one is uh, to raise the fund to the investor, and secondly, is via the bank, means the financial institutions, right? But uh, for the investor, if let's say you're talking about the investor, definitely they want to see the cash flow projections. Because if you have the cash flow projection, it basically tell the investor like, basically you know uh, how the business is going to be in the next 12 months or five years, right? If can you imagine if today you are just an investor and you have like 1 billion on hand and you want a potential in, on this uh, so-called particular business and you say, hey, I want to invest the money into your business. Can you come up, can you, can you show me, you know, how the future look like? But you not, if you today, you not even can so-called prepare a cash flow projections how are you going to convince the investor that actually you know how to run a business, right? I think the investor mostly uh, will look from this context, right? So yes, the answer is yes. Cash flow projection is a must. Whereas if we look at from another angle, from bank perspective, of course the bank understand that, you know, not many, uh, it would depends on basically uh, how much fund you are you're going to raise. So we do have experience to help the client to, to, to so-called uh, to apply for a lending from a, from a bank, you know, if let's say the, the amount of uh, up to like 20 million, 30 million, they also will ask the same thing, cash flow projections, okay? Mm -hmm. Because uh, they need to know, is your collections okay? Okay, uh, how's your cash flow look like in, in, uh, in 12 months? Because definitely they don't want to lend the money to someone that cannot pay. Yeah, I, I wanted to add uh, something as well to this uh, yeah. because last time uh, we also operating operate uh, this um, investment company, some but uh, also people known as a uh, venture capitalist or VC firm. Um, a lot of time those uh, company that they fail is because uh, their runway uh, shorter than what they thought. Uh, runway means uh, they run out of cash flow, and then the money of the investors still need. To some time before they come in. So they yeah. hit a very difficult position. And the time, is, if, you know, the borrowing something like this, if you have a lot of, uh, <laughs> when you're in difficulty, it's sometimes it's very hard to borrow again. Right. But right. when you have uh, in a very nice position yes. and uh, financially very healthy, actually a lot of financial institutions would like to lend you money. So right. that time, uh, if we, we saw majority of the, the fundraising company or the portfolio have to, almost grows down uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, because of the cash flow issue. So mm -hmm. I th thanks, uh, Jeremy. I think we run out of time. Uh, and sure, sure. I would like to uh, thanks, uh, Jeremy, for your presentation and sharing. I would like to uh, take over the presentation or the, the screen so that I can introduce the second speaker. Sure, sure. Uh, OK, I will just uh, pass back the, 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 the talk. OK, you can share now. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you. So you you see uh, my screen now. Yep. Okay. Thank yes, you. Yes. Okay. Would like to do a short poll before I introduce the next speaker. Yep. I will launch it. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. So we hope that we can take some uh, feedback before we start the next session. So this allow us to continue to improve our program.
Yep, we're receiving some feedbacks. Okay, sure. I think there's a few more, then we can continue to yeah. introduce the next speaker. Okay, I would like to uh, introduce the next. So, is, is the screen still there, right? Uh, my, the screen I share. So, I would like to introduce the next speaker. Um, his name is uh, Yi Hao. He is a senior managing partner of ACMF BOSR Consulting. So, Yi Hao Course Frank is an industry blueprint integrated business solution architecture, ICT. And Yihao's qualification is a Bachelor of Science in Information System Engineering, Campbell University, US. And Yihao also the author of ACMF BOSR framework, the Business Optimization and Security and Risk uh, framework. I would like to stop my sharing and uh, Yihao, I would like to hand over the screen to you. Feel free to take over the screen from here. Hi guys, um, can you hear me clearly? This is Yihao. Yes, I can hear you. Yes, your line is, uh, mine is clear. Right, I share my screen right now. Give me a signal when you see my screen. I see the screen, but no presenter, no presenter mode yet. It's still a PPT All right. mode. Yeah. Understand. Mm -hmm. Yep, it's already a present, uh, this is a pre uh, presentation mode. Uh, feel free to go ahead. Yes, please. Thank you. All right. Um, happy Friday, everyone. Uh, I'm Yi Hao. I'm the co-founder for the SEMF BOSR Consulting, which is specialized in the business continuity and the business blueprint mainly. So today, I would like to cover and share the instant business continuity for everybody. Like what Jeremy mentioned just now, um, we, the cash flow actually is the one of the key element now. The next question I want to cover a bit more on the how do we enable the, the business continuity for all the entrepreneurs like you guys. First of all, let me just share a bit what's going on right now. Right? This is exactly happening and some of the news are just yesterday. Right? So with that, I'm pretty sure the entrepreneur like you guys is that start to thinking is my office or my factory can open or not? And also some of the questions that have been raised by the audience. I would like to address uh, later from the question. Right? At the same time, now, how do we keep track of our entire business operation status during this uh, work from home? Or maybe in the lockdown period. Now, how do we oversee work from home if we can work from home? Now, how about my supply chain impact for my businesses? And as well as how can my customer able to take our goods for the time being? So all in all, if I can summarize to that, so are you suffering for the lockdown, right? So are you have a peace of mind with all your staff working from home? Assuming um, your business is fall under the insurance services line. So how are you going to concern the next if the MCO order have finished or maybe have another uh, status looks like, right? And how do you improve your overhead cost for this period? So now let me introduce you to one of the solution to address the, all the concern here. We call it remote working solution. So how does it work? Basically the remote Working solutions all about to address the business continuity. Now, this is a fact already happening right now, right? And in all the MNC, they already started enable the business for the work from home or under the group, right? At the same time, the most important thing is right now is all about the employee productivity as well as uh, the entrepreneurial business operations. So with that, the key is that how can we measure and monitor the performance is a key, 
right? So now, remote working solutions should be addressed from that, from this perspective. On the other point, now, I think uh, Louis brother and the Jeremy mentioned just now, one of the trends in the industry, especially uh, after this COVID-19, that raises such an impact on the industry. And I think they also fall under the challenge that, you know, uh, some of the key employees no longer might be in the, the physical local. So, so you may need to enter out, those are the key talent, maybe out of town or maybe overseas talents to, in order for you to continue your business. And not a lot of this basically is all about the cost. But how do you maintain or perhaps lower your overhead cost? So the key word is that how can we start and how do we ensure all the concerns that can be addressed here? The step is pretty simple. There's only a few steps, right? If I can summarize to that, uh, the first one definitely is the, we call it, you need to have the remote working solution success criteria. The first thing is that we need to have the, your business impact analyst for your business or your businesses. So what does it mean by business impact analyst? It's all about the assess on whether your remote uh, solution basically on the business right now is go down. How much is worth cost when for the 24 hours, let's just say. For this example, let's just say your business is A. You only have office, you don't have a factory. Now, this is a sample like assuming that a down 24 server is worth 5,000 losses, right? This is, could be happen to other things. So on the other hand, this is a moment that is quick also as a tips to assess your business right now. If you're down for 24 hours, what is the worth uh, value? In this case, in regular Malaysia or maybe US dollar, right? Uh, how much is worth losses, right? So give you a, give a quick indicator. Should you need a remote working solution or not? If the answer is, if a 24 hours down is only lost like less than five ringgit or five USD, chances are you might not need to have any remote working solution, right? But on the other hand, if you have more than that, let's just say it's about 5,000 USD per day losses, chances are you might need to have the remote working solution if any. So with that, you also might to link to the next question. Once you know how much you worth a losses, uh, 24 hours for your businesses. So uh, you might need to know uh, what is the coverage you want to cover as your survival capacity. So example, you want to cover 100% your business or you want to cover 75% your business or you want to cover 50% or maybe lower. It's really up to your choice. Of course, the carry is all fall back to just now the uh, information. Right. If the information or the losses per day is higher, chances are you might need to increase your uh, business continuity availability. Now, once you know all the information, I'm pretty sure that the next question on your mind is that how to make this happen? There are two items only here. So first one, you will mention your Business SOP is ready, whatever you do right now in office operation. So you might make sure this SOP can able to convert it and put it under the work from home solution as well. For example, for this business A, so you might need to cover your operation. You need to have a sales to order operation flow, your order for payment flow, your purchasing, your inventory perhaps, the supply chain flow, including billing as well. So all in all, you need to have the flow in mind, right? Then once you know in mind, you know exactly your business operation, how it works, then you need to start to confirm and ensure uh, your company employee to have such a uh, measure and monitoring readiness can inside your business operation. So again, with this example, business A, once you close down, right, you want to enable work from home, you also need to know the monitor the employee KPI, right? I'm pretty sure. Then you might need to 
ensure your KPI have been uh, delegated to your staff, right? Whether it's sales, finance, admin, etc. So when you set all the information there, then that's where you need to start to confirm, right? What is the best uh, remote solution in the market? If you can summarize to that, a uh, major point is usually three, right? We just need to ensure your business right now, your business SOP, able to integrate fully in the new remote working solution so that this remote working solution can be your business processes gatekeeper to help you to monitor everything remotely, right? On top of that, you also need to ensure your employee KPI able to fit into the system as well so that you can start to measure and monitor plan versus actual on the flow. Then on the other hand, I'm pretty sure that at this moment, you might need to have a handy tool as an entrepreneur to oversee entire operation uh, status right now so that you can make the informed decision timely. Right? This is a sample that how it looks like on the table checklist. Now with that, then we'll be bringing back to the key benefit here. That's of course, we can enable our business continuity already and continue hit the sales revenue and profit. This is the more important things, right? And for the factory business owner, right? You might also can uh, benefit from the real time delivery status. For example, the time of the raw material or packaging to make the informed decision using the remote working solution. On top of that right now, I think you also benefit uh, for the social distancing because everybody uh, work from home. That will be the case that, you know, we can also increase this piece of work. If I put a sample here, if we allow, let me just put a point form here. Assuming that now your business actually fall under essential service. Your office is closed but your factory is still in operating. Now, as a business owner, if you have a working, solu working so remote solution ready, then your office is in operations. Now, the key question is, you still can able to monitor the factory performance. At the same time, office is closed, no worry. We can uh, enable your key employees in that case, Right, whether they work from home in the secure locations, they may continue to perform the daily operation remotely. Then with that case, business owner like you, you can able to using this tool to monitor entire progress. So you can update the customer or the supplier based on the status and business as usual. Now, the second point, of course, the remote working solution, you can immediately benefit is that we have a dashboard and to monitor plan versus actual in terms of the daily operation perspective, as well as the employee performance. So with that, also with the study we're capturing, right, uh, the staff who are working from home because of the road life balance, they are fall to sleep slightly uh, not easy compared to the long hour working in the office. Now, with this MO, MCO perspective, there will be a crucial thing right now is that uh, to communicate is a team is a very important right now. It's simply because that now with this uh, very difficult times, I think this is the first this happened in Malaysia or maybe some of the other countries, right? Uh, to have work from home is for such a long time, right? So that is also give an impression on the employee, they are undiscomfort. So with the remote working solution, besides the email, WhatsApp, and whatever tool we have to communicate our employee and appear, and with the remote working solution, with the flow we just now, we also can give us full support to the transition on this work from home as well with the right tool and the right mechanism. Now, this is also given uh, additional benefit to the entrepreneurial. Uh, this is a time that local employee no longer limit to the, our, 
our entrepreneur. We can explore even further with the tools of the remote working solution, especially right now. So we can even hire or recruit our town and overseas talents, right? That also all in line with those are the uh, entrepreneur which is having a manufacturing industry, which is towards a 4.0 standard direction. Because as I heard on the assessment from quite a number of a business owner, entrepreneur in this industry, they are quite hard to find the right talent in locally. Right? So this is uh, another opportunity for the entrepreneur like us can able to venture the key talent. Right. For long term, we also can immediately be looking for the optimized and overhead costs uh, for all perspective. Uh, so with Yihau, that, uh, Yihau, yes. I have a question because uh, mm. just now, or the current situation is that mm. when the domestic GDP might be shrinking due to recession or global recession, mm. and but the effective market size is actually increasing due to the internet economy and also online buying behavior and online offline uh, consumption behavior now. Mm -hmm. So then there is uh, also a movement that people, uh, instead of terminate their key talent, they convert some of their key talent to be a contractor. But that means they're no longer able to fully utilize their time, but they allow the key talent to be a contractor. That means only using part of their time. And now the challenge that, or the opportunity for the talent is that they now because they are a supplier now, mm. they actually can take on a few more projects from local or overseas now. So yeah. will this a remote working solution provision for such a working environment for the employer side? or how that can be used by the employee side uh, to, to move into such architecture, move from a full-time employment into a contractor uh, position. Okay. Uh, thanks for the question, Luis. Uh, in fact, uh, there are two questions there, if I can speed up. The first question you are saying that, how can, uh, if, uh, with this uh, climate, right, how can we uh, ensure for the key talent from the permanent staff become contractor, the first question, and how do we ensure the, you know, uh, the security of the employee side and the, how they allow the employee side, employer side to able to ensure whatever I say to you actually is a, a business firewall. Yeah. 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 It's okay. because uh, whatever assignment like this, because the mm. person no longer a full-time employee and, and then how, if, Will it become a backdoor attack? Yep. Okay. So let me answer the first question. The first question is that um, the remote working solution, uh, by default, you need to address that because we already know from the traditional business already moved to gig economy. From the gig economy, we are combined to move to, to internet economy, if I can put it at an here. So meaning that everybody can work, everybody. So the security part of the working solution is a top priority also. So the system must be catered in terms of the authentication to the basic one. On top of that, when we assign any assignment to the contractor, the information should be signed inside the employer environment virtually, right? So they can work one within the virtual environment. At the same time, they can deliver the job, right? On the other hand, we also ensure that data should not be leaked out within the organization, which is on the employee, the employer side. So that is also serve two purpose, right? So hope that I answer your question, uh, Luis, from there. Uh, yes. Uh, mm. Then the next question I have is that in order to achieve that, what are the common tools or actually or ACMF, mm. BOSR have a product? Uh, because this is the architecture that I don't commonly see that such a combination mm. yet. They actually have a full suite remote working solution. And this how hybrid, I, I don't know, because, because I'm not a technical guy. So do, do mm. you have any recommendation or you observe anything? Yeah, of course, uh, if we can break down to the technical in theory, right, the remote working solution must be have two main components. One is to ensure that the connectivity between the employee and the employer environment, right? The environment should be flexible enough and yet is secure enough. So normally, this kind of environment, they should have a trusted a VPN between the employee and an employee. 
that's the first step for the connectivity. So on top of that, we also have to ensure the flow, uh, the tasks have been given, the deliveries have been expected. So meaning the entire, your SOP flow again, your task management, your project management, all need to be in plan in so that all this working uh, flow should be able to seamlessly, whether you're working physically in office or they're working remotely. So that is actually bundled in whole with that. So uh, on top of that, uh, SEMF remote working solution right now is able to cater that two features. Um, can I uh, can I pop in for a second? This yes, is uh, yes, Steve. Steve from uh, the security and risk part of the OSR. Um, I work with uh, with Eha. Um, so yeah, one of the things to bear in mind, um, I think a lot of people are hearing about VPNs for the first time. Um, uh, apart from those who just want to stream Netflix from the US. Um, so the thing to remember about a VPN that's uh, connecting to your, your head office is that anything you connect to that VPN remotely, it's the equivalent of that device being plugged directly into your network in the office, which obviously comes along with a whole bunch of um, security risks if people are using their own equipment from home um, if they don't have uh, good enough uh, antivirus protection and things like this. And as Lewis's uh, example, if you've got someone who's not necessarily tightly bound to that company, who could be, even be a competitor, um, is now also unable to connect to your network through, through the VPN. So this is where um, a zero trust policy would come in. Um, which I'll probably go into a bit of detail next week uh, when I do my session on this. But basically zero trust is you give nobody any more permission than they need to have. And every device is individually authenticated on the network, whether it's local or remote, it doesn't matter whether you're coming through directly from the internet or through a VPN, or if you're plugged into the network directly, um, it makes no difference to to the setup of the of the infrastructure, so only those people who are verified, only devices that are uh, certificated, only they can connect and do anything. And as Yiha mentioned, ideally to to stop data being uh, being lost from the company, you set up a virtual environment so that effectively the PC is running on the company's. Uh, own infrastructure, so it's not actually running on the PC of the person outside, it's running inside the business. There's no thank reason you very much, for data uh, to come out. Hey, thank you, Steve. Uh, thank you, Yihao. Yeah. I think there's limitation of time because we have uh, two questions that we need mm. to answer to sure. from the participants. So mm. I would like to open the first, uh, the first round of question to the panelists. Um, uh, are there any of you have a question for Yihao or Jeremy? You may ask so. Uh, Misa, you may you may uh, proceed to ask your questions. Uh, I have a question to Yi Hao. Okay. Hi, Nikki here. Hi, Nikki. What about, what about those small or even micro SME? They, they didn't even put their KPI or their SOP in place. Can mm -hmm. they still benefit from this remote working solution? Okay. The answer is yes, Nikki. So uh, this is a, a flow I just want to mention, right? Uh, all they need to do is just uh, capture down all these steps so that we just make sure that the SOP, right, is ready, right? If they're not ready, you can talk to us. We can be able to plug to the things because I'm pretty sure that in common things is the SOP flow is under the key employee and the business owner themselves. <laughs> so with that, what we need to do is help them to download from their mind income the flow to the system, right? Then we will solve that problem. Yeah, I have the uh, same observation as well. A lot of uh, mm -hmm. micro SME owner or businesses, why they, they are not growing? Uh, simply because they are not consciously aware of their key competency or the reason they are earning profit. So as a result, their entire business is not manageable, not sustainable and not scalable. And the, 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 the answer to that particular challenge is quite simple. They just need to put in a proper SOP to at least um, uh, everyone aware what is happening. Then only they use it as a base document for further enhancement. So 
So without a SOP and a conscious awareness of what is happening, a few potential of growing the company or fixing the bugs is extremely difficult actually. Yeah, it did. Thanks, thanks for the highlight, uh, it's exactly spot on. This is uh, the deep impact why uh, try not to double of, uh, the business owner or entrepreneur, uh, they're facing the issue, especially the key, the key employee holding all the uh, information and the logic behind. Once they, the big key employee is uh, leave the company due to whatever reason, that's where they start to suffer. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any more uh, questions from the panel? If not, then I will take over the screen. Is the mic? Uh, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, can you guys see my screen? Okay. Yes. So you share. Mm. I, I would like to ask another poll. So about the second session before we proceed. Uh, to answer uh, two questions yeah, from sure. the participants. Yeah, sure. I, I want it. Sure. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, it is up. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Please uh, uh, help us to understand um, the uh, the value created at the uh, second session, so that we can use it as an input to further improve our performance. Thank you very much, everyone. So as long as you take a look at the Zoom page, so you will see the a post already up, uh, feedback for session two. Uh, we are receiving 16 of the uh, response. Okay. 17. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, let's end the poll. So then I will proceed to answer the question. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, I would like to answer a uh, uh, question asked by uh, participants. Uh, first question is about uh, how those product that is hard to sell online. Um, okay. Whenever you look into monetization or repositioning or repurpose of your product, firstly, you need to understand the strategic value chain and monetization of your own industry. What it means by strategic value chain and monetization of your industry? Basically, it's about how your, the companies or players in your industry, they do customer acquisition. Customer acquisition, it consists of uh, key stages such as uh, uh, product um, or brand awareness, brand expectation or product expectation setting, and then lead generation, and then follow up until negotiation and closing the deal or capture the, the order. The second key stage will be a key phase will be orders fulfillment and customer satisfaction. And the third one will be repeat order, water share expansion strategy. And the fourth one is upselling strategy. So do I, do you, do we need to really put all, must be online, online, only we say ourselves is part of the internet economy. How about those uh, driving, uh, riding a motorcycle and deliver those uh, food and, and serve a product, tangible product to houses? Are they not part of the ecosystem? They are totally offline and then they take the orders and also the instruction through their smartphone. And some, do you really need to have an application? Can't I just use it because of some uh, messaging, messaging or some email, freeware and call myself part of the ecosystem? Actually, the answer is yes. You don't really need to be the e-commerce company or mobile commerce company to say I'm part of the online business. 
because online business it consists of offline as well like for example the raw material extraction <laughs> and also the manufacturing of the tangible product and even the some people that doing the job they may not be online as well so so when you want to be part of the whole ecosystem you firstly you have to understand the whole strategic value chain and monetization of your own business first of your own industry first and then you look which are the portion is more suitable to you now when you do that at the time you might want to do and understand your business dna that means your strategy or your unique value position of your company or unique selling position of your company or sometimes known as a differentiator or positioning of your company what i have come across or we come across is that a lot of businesses they don't understand their unique value position or unique selling position they thought strength is like um i just need to say i'm i'm strong in this then i am okay it's not true because like example if you are driving at 200 km per hour is it fast if let's say the other car is driving at 400 km per hour you are pretty slow but if let's say the rest is only a 20 km per hour you are super fast already so competition is about relativity so if you do not understand your relative strength versus your competitor basically everything you say is a wishful thinking is is it is just that you wish is true but then you do not know is true or not that is highly dangerous so you do need to know what is your unique value position then only map it to the strategic value chain and monetization of industry then only you can successfully reposition it so that's how we do a uh, restructuring of company during 1990 something and also 2000 something when the crisis at time we repurpose so during the time the companies under our leadership we grow two to three times instead of <laughs> shrink at three so because why this is a process you can do it again and again and you will find it very interesting and also need to do it because it's survival and uh, is 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 part of things and about the second question that um a participant would like to know is there any interest free fun what do you think answer yes yeah it, when it comes to funding of course you have uh, you can put it into a few uh, segment but what the people more, more, most of the sme know is a bank loan or borrowing and uh, but the other side they don't really uh, aware is called a uh, equity financing that means equity financing means you attract the investor to invest in your company by take up some shares new shares usually and these shares you can release in such a thing called ordinary shares or preference shares uh, or anything that you can think of and is it sometimes really up to imagination uh, but when you architecture the fundraising or interest free fundraising the time you really need to know where is your company today in the eyes of investor now company you can basically separate them into a few stages one is the incubation they have a concept but they start to develop a prototype or do some soft launch a test market they are a startup they have a proven a uh, soft launch a successful product they try to grow and early growth that means everything monetization is very proven customer acquisition all proven they try to hit all the sales revenue target profit target and the geographical coverage and mid to strong growth is further grow but then this is a time that they can use a 10 times 20 times or 30 times into it and then a uh, pre ipo company or post ipo company but be very careful can be sorry be very careful about ipo ipo is a initial public offering it means you'll get your company listed in this process you do need to get advice from the capital market a uh, license holder that means these are people we call them uh, ipo sponsor and also investment bank they are needed because they are the one uh, only one uh, qualified to uh, answer the question under this uh, public uh, fundraising of course there are some other public fundraising that is not listed class uh, and when come to behavior of the investor you can briefly categorize them into uh, a few category one is a 3f is a family friends and fans and then the angels investor venture capitalists private equity family office investment bank and private bank and so on and so forth uh, venture capitalists today uh, 
it's last, it used to be started because of a technology uh, company, but today people use it quite loosely to describe to describe those investors' uh, mandate or the investment guideline are between angel investor and private equity because private equity generally is their their ticket size the, or the investment amount is quite high. Uh, usually, if you do, you are not talking about anything more than hundred million, they are usually not keen to talk about it. So venture capitalists fill up the gaps between angel and private equity, even sometimes it's not a technology company. So these are the area you should take a look. Then you talk about interest-free, all those just I mentioned, they do provide uh, interest-free uh, fundraising or investment product or investment. But you do need to know their mandate. Of course, this mandate is that you have to talk to them. You have to talk to them, you have to ask them what is your mandate, uh, and then they let them explain to you. Then, yeah, but of course, you do need to have your product uh, roadmap and also your, your cash flow projection audit ready. Um, if not, you may not get the, a slot or a time to talk to them because their time usually is very, very busy. They have to go through many, many deals before they invest in one. So, you, if you are not prepared, usually they will not talk to you at all. Yeah. Um, uh, I take two questions for this round and hold on, let me. allow me to uh, share my screen again. So, um, Today's uh, Asia Business Talk Show, um, we'll upload them to YouTube. And um, for any speakers or people that would like to be part of the, take up the session to contribute value to the, to the market, uh, please uh, send your profile to abts um, at acmfgroup.com. Uh, so for now, uh, thank you for your participation and thank you for the panelists and thank you to the speaker, Jeremy and also Yi Hao. Thank you very much. And for those who would like to contact with them, their email and all the profile uh, already uploaded or will be uploaded to Facebook uh, at the acmfgroup.com. Uh, thank you very much, guys. Thank you very much. Bye for now. And see you again next Friday, 3.30 p.m. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye everyone. Thank you everyone. Bye, everyone. Yeah. Thank see you, you next week. See you next week.